Well, welcome, everybody. And um, I'd first of all thank you for your prayers. It's been a, a tough few weeks for me. And um, last week, as I shared briefly, um, I don't know if you noticed it, but there was a certain gasping for breath because my lungs had been operated on. There had been blood taken out of them, and I still was bruised in the, in the lung, and it was difficult to speak. But I don't have that this week, and um, I'm happy to be here and give thanks to God and to you. It's been a joy to know that all of you out there are holding you up. It's a very real experience. And so everybody has texted, asked, badgered, na nagged. <laughs> they want reward and punishment number two. And um, <laughs> yes, I think I would too. So I am assuming, and I guess it's a big assuming, but I'm assuming you are reading Luke 15. We can't read it every week. And, um, and so it is um, that assumption that I come with. And sec <clears throat> secondly, that you um, remember everything I said last week. Can't keep repeating that. But having said that, just those first verses brings us right to what we're talking about. Now, all the tax gatherers and the, notice it says the sinners, they would be notorious sinners. They would be the ones that the FBI had their eyes on. Um, they were known for their activities and known so decent people didn't hang with them. But Jesus, they were coming near him to listen to him. So they took the initiative of coming near. You know, it's, it's like a, a frightened dog, and it, 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 it's not sure. Have you ever had one of those? It, it's, it's been beaten up, and it, it's run, and now you try to feed it, and it runs away, but not too far because it's wanting what you got. And, and they came near to him to listen to him. But then the Pharisees and the scribes, they were the religious leaders that really controlled the whole of the Galilee and Judea. Every decent person in those areas were somewhat following the Pharisees and the scribes. They began to grumble, saying, This man, Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. And in response to that, in response to that line, that's the biggest line in the chapter. This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's what's wrong. Whatever else was wrong between Jesus and the Pharisees, this is what's wrong today. And it's the biggest thing. This chapter, you could almost say, was the axe that, cut between Jesus and the Pharisees. Because of this chapter, the Pharisees pushed Jesus to crucifixion. This is the heart of it. And you might miss it. This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's it. Okay, we can put up with a lot, but we cannot put up with that. That is the last straw. And in response to that, Jesus gave these parables. And so they're not nice little parables about fluffy white lambs uh, and one of them gets lost and, uh, and the prodigal son with the, you know, tie the yellow ribbon by the old apple tree. No, 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 no. This is, Jesus is throwing down the gauntlet. This is a war chapter. And Jesus is saying this and this alone is the kingdom of God. And, um, and, and so having said that, the whole of this series of stories, and certainly that phrase, is about God's love. And if you don't know it, that is a word alone in the Greek. The language of the New Testament written in Greek 
that word is agape. And it's a singular word, out there, different, utterly other. Because the word for love on the streets and in the cities was eros. And eros is really, if you translate it into English, it's what people on the street today mean by love. And, and it's, that's human love, eros. Agape, we translate it as unconditional love. But it's really a lot more than that. The love of God, agape, you could say it is the, the energy that, that pours forth from the very being of God. Um, people say um, uh, in, in, in the past I've been interviewed and people say, and what is your message? And when I say it's the unconditional love of God, they look at me weird, and then they say, how sweet. Uh, you know, he, he's talking about love. And we need love in the world, don't we? And um, no, you've got it wrong. The agape, the love of God, is not something sweet. It is the mighty energy. It is the dynamic power of God in action, the energy of God. And yet when I say that, it is the most beautiful um, there's nothing to be afraid of. If I say just the mighty energy, then I might be afraid of that. But there's nothing to be afraid of here. It is described in 1 Corinthians 13, and this love is kind. It is gentle. It, this love is pure love. There's nothing in it that, that's got a hook in it to grab you. It sets you free. This love says 1 Corinthians 13, does not keep a record of wrong. And that's what absolutely blows religion apart. You can't do that. I remember I was in a certain church so many hundreds of years ago, and the, I, I said of a certain person that um, I, I felt she needed help, but I didn't know her. I, I was new to the church. And um, so, um, did anybody, could anybody help me? And one of the elders said, I can help you. And from his inside pocket, he pulled out a little book. And he turned and he says, here for the last five years of all that she's done wrong. He, he had kept a record of everybody in the church. He knew, but he didn't, didn't record all the nice things they'd done, just all the bad things they'd done. So he, he had a hook on them. The love of God, and that is, uh, incidentally, what that man did is religion taken to it. Maybe it's extreme, but, but religion is always condemning. Religion is always finding something wrong with you. And they believe they are reflecting God in so doing. But this energy of God, and now I'll use the word energy, but it's an energy that doesn't keep a record of wrong. And I've yet to hear that preached about. People won't go there. You can't say that of God because religion hangs upon the fact he does keep a record. And, and they will preach that on the great judgment day he'll open the books and he's got his little black book to say everything you've done wrong. It's religion. But the energy, the mighty energy of God's love is kind, is gentle, it is beautiful, it is patient. He never gives up on you, and he never leaves you, and he never keeps a record of wrong. So don't bring up your past. He hasn't got a record of it. And that energy of God's love is with every one of us at all times. But you know that love only by revelation. And, and by that I mean the Holy Spirit has got to gently open the, your eyes and open the door of your heart, because naturally speaking, we don't believe it. Uh, and I can see those of you on Zoom are agreeing, agreeing. Well, hold it, we're all agreeing. Until, there's always that until we can't believe it. It's too good to be true. And, and, and so I say it's by revelation. The Holy Spirit must open my inside eyes to see this love or I don't get it. Um, 
when the world sees this love, they're amazed. If you see this love in action, in any way you're amazed at it, it's the kind of person who gets the honors and the presidential awards because he did something that nobody in their right mind would do. Um, yeah, amazed, they admire. But while they're doing that, they're unable to comprehend it. How could a person do that? How could a person give themselves away? How could a person forgive what they've gone through? <clears throat> they can't conceive of it as a part of their life. It's good to look at it in other people. It's a grand idea, but how could that ever happen in my home, in my kitchen? How could it ever be this unconditional love? And of course, others, the religious especially, the more religious you get, the more you're horrified. How, how, and that's the case in front of us. How could Jesus sit down? Not only sit down, but receive. Receive sinners. That word we talked about last week. And, and eat with them. They're horrified. The same way as I said, if your pastor was found down on the Jersey Shore entertaining mafia, uh, that's what. That's exactly what's happening here. Huh? You're, you're horrified. You're scandalized. And, and the person involved, you condemn them. How could they do it? That's unholy. That's unrighteous. That's ungodly. And if you're a sort of neutral sort of chap, it's still odd. It's still a bit wacko, you know. That and... and Please understand this. Jesus was not that gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Um, Jesus upset the entire social life of Israel. He sat down with the most notorious sinners and the tax collectors who were the mafia of the day, only they were backed up by the Roman Empire. Jesus sat with them. And as I said, he received them. And if you weren't here and don't know what I'm talking about, the word receive is a <clears throat> massive word. It, it would mean I grab you and say, I'm so glad you're here. It, it, it means that I am um, receiving you. I, it's, it's not, well, I'm glad you're here. It is I might um, take your face in my hands and say, I can't believe you came to my invitation. I received you. And remember, at the end of the parables, Jesus puts the word in the mouth of the Father. It is necessary that we eat together. And of course, that was the problem the Pharisees had. You're eating with these people. You received them, and then you're eating with them. Jesus ends the parables by saying, it is necessary. Yeah, he standing in solidarity. You remember we've talked in months past that to eat, here when we eat in, in the West, it only means that you're hungry. And so you go into some places and there's other people at the table and you just sit down at the other end of the table uh, and you stuff your face because you're hungry and they're doing the same thing. And you might look up, you might say hi, and walk out, you've done it. But you try that in third world. Oh, you can't do that because they're much more educated in the things of the heart and things that have been with us for um, multi-centuries. You go to third world. When you eat, well, you don't eat with just anybody because to eat with somebody is to forge a bond with them. It means you are now my brother. It means you are now, I stand in solidarity with you. And when you are joy, I am joy. And when you weep, I weep. And when they hate you, they hate me. That's to eat. Dangerous thing to eat. But of course, if, you, if you're invited to eat with someone and you say no, that's a declaration of war. Because it's saying I won't stand in solidarity with you. Eating, big stuff. 
Okay, say it again. Jesus ate with the most notorious criminals and the taxmen. Now do you realize what he was doing? First of all, he'd hugged them, received them, and then sat down and ate. How could a man who declared that he represented God, that he was indeed a revelation of God, how could he ever sit down with those people? I mean, look how they, do I have to explain it? Their, their behavior was enough. There's no church in town that would welcome them into membership. Look what they're doing. Look what they've done. They have stained the morality of all in Israel. And he now publicly, some public place, he sits down and eats and binds himself to them. So they called him a friend of tax men and sinners. And that's another word we've never discussed, I don't think. But friend in this country means absolutely nothing, except you're on Facebook with unknown people. But um, again, go to Third World and say, that's my friend. It means you've eaten, you're bonded together, you will never leave each other or forsake each other. And they called him the friend of tax men and notorious sinners and said he represented God. Can you hear the, the horror of this chapter? And religion said, how can this possibly be? Because everybody he's in solidarity with, we've damned and condemned to hell. Do you realize every Sabbath day in the synagogues of that day, they named these people publicly and announced they can never be forgiven. They've sinned themselves beyond forgiveness. Every, every Sabbath, they named these people. Jesus said, <laughs> you're either going to laugh at this or cry. That Jesus sat down in solidarity with these people and said he represented God, that he actually revealed the being of God. On one occasion, he said, no one knows the Father except me. And I'll show you too if you want. But he said, see, and that, that receive stuff that I said, let me just back on it a moment. He was not only having a meal with them, he had received them with warm, excited reception. He describes that, he had to, because that was part of the anger. So when he told the story of the sheep that got lost, do you remember when the shepherd found it? He said to people, I'm having a feast over this. He said, this is so important. So he said, rejoice with me, because I found my sheep. And rejoice is a Hebrew word, and you can find it in Hebrew communities in America today. It means to leap, spin around for sheer joy. It is the dance taken to extreme, and um, it's big, big time. And the same thing when the woman found the coin, she said, rejoice with me. And in the ears of any Israelite, rejoice meant I'm being invited to a party. Uh, and, and Jesus said, when I, when I see these people, and remember, they were coming near, he goes out and says, I've been waiting for you. And uh, rejoice with me. Rejoice. We, we know nothing about that word today. It's not in English, really. Just there. Uh, rejoice. Have you realized it originates in the Holy Trinity? Um, pure, pure joy. Rejoice. So when we say Father, Son, and Spirit, it, it is the Father with unbounded joy in the very being and sight of the Son and the Son to the Father and the Spirit. It, it, the word means pure laughter. 
You ever thought of that? Laughter originated in God. To delight in. To delight over. It means overflowing joy. You could almost say it's a volcanic eruption inside of you. I mean, this isn't a hollow laugh at a cocktail party. This is an explosive joy. In fact, the closest to all of these words we're looking at, um, I, I've been sometimes in a place, and you've got it all over the internet uh, on videos, when um, someone comes back from the war, and, and but no one expected them, you know, and uh, have you seen when he goes into the classrooms and the little kid goes crazy and, or I've been at airports where they get off the plane and, and the wife and the children run and there's hugging and that's these words. Please get it. That, this, this is what Jesus was doing to these notorious sinners. It's, it's the energy of joy again. It is reaching out, drawing others into its embrace. You can never do it alone. You can't have a rejoice alone. It's, it's the sound of acceptance. It's being the beloved. It's freedom and soaring above care. Any sense of lack is forgotten. Rejoice, it's akin to play. There's no effort to it. You don't, you don't need to plan it. You, know, you don't sit there and say, I'm trying to rejoice. Uh, it's, it's no, no struggle to achieve it. Okay, do you, do you see why religion, and even decent people, no decent person would hang out with these characters. So everything is focused on the feast. Jesus could stand and say a lot of strange things. Jesus, you know, could sit down with the Pharisees and scribes and debate and talk. It's okay. We don't agree with him, but as Nicodemus said, we know you've come from God. You couldn't do things as you're doing without that. So, but then he sat down. He received, and he, that's the, oh no, 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 no. We can't go there. This is the great separation. Everything focused on the feast. It's the last straw. He's eating. He's accepting. He's receiving. He's celebrating. He's honoring persons whose behavior demands punishment, or at least it demands that they're excluded from God's presence. That, you see, that upset. Do you see that? It upset the entire normal of the world system. To love, to accept. Well, if I reward you, it's because you're being and doing good, you know? And if it's in another context and you win, well, all the more reason. We give you a gold medal, you see, because you won. You won, he didn't. Makes you a better person. They'll use you in advertising. And if you come to speak, people will come to listen because you won. You're gooder. You're better. And why are you so? Because you behaved in a way that was accepted by the crowd. Huh. Look, that's another word of this world system is comparison. I'm constantly comparing myself to others and reminding myself I'm better than them. They didn't do this, I did it. I would never do that. Just the Pharisee said it. Jesus put the prayer in his mouth. I thank you, O oh God, I'm not as other men. You know, wouldn't do that. 
because the whole world system is you do good, you are good, and therefore we reward you. And if you win, you're better than anybody else. It's the way it is. And if you don't measure up, at one point of not measuring up, then you're excluded. And in, in our society, that doesn't take very long. You can walk into a crowd and be excluded immediately. And why? Because you wear the wrong clothes. How daft can we get that a, that a person is excluded? Uh, and good is what you wear. Good is how you talk. Good is how you sit at a table. Accept, reject. It's all about behavior. Huh. In the world of public opinion, these men deserved punishment because of their actions because they were other different in terms of moral goodness before decent people and in the parable that jesus told that really we're looking at we read it and we say how sweet how nice you know what the father did understand that was an atomic bomb that dropped on Israel. Jesus tells a story in which the younger brother, who was equal to those taxmen and the notorious sinners by this time, he rewarded the younger brother with a feast, sitting down, but not only with him, with the whole village. He rewards him. And the elder brother, who is the poster child for the Pharisees, but on the other hand, a very nice, decent chap, a hard worker, and you wouldn't mind having him as a neighbor, but he's excluded. But his behavior is so right. Why is he excluded? And the younger brother included. You see... The father in the parable was coming from a totally different world. And we've got to wake up to realize if we believe the gospel, if we call ourselves Christians, we are coming from a totally different world. And I find in so many churches, that's not a different world at all. It is, in fact, is worse than anywhere else. They accept only the good and the behavior right people. And you come in and anything that happens here is to get your behavior right. And so we use all the same systems that the world would use to try and moralize. And... No. Let's get this straight. The gospel that we are announcing that originates in Jesus Christ is from a different world altogether. He introduced this word agape, love that is utterly different from the eros, which only will accept the high, best, and most beautiful. We wouldn't be here but for agape. That's the truth about most of us. And those who think they would, well, that's your problem. <laughs> you do need the agape. Yeah. It's a love that's unconditional. Do we even know what that means? Love toward those who do not deserve it. In fact, whose behavior forbade acceptance. You come to the heart of agape, unconditional love. He does this. Love goes into that darkness and loves those people because he's accept, he is accepting their sin. And he's going to die for that. You see, is, 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 he's not there yet. But he remember what I said? He sits with the tax collectors. And therefore their shame, their condemnation that the whole society gave to them now falls upon Jesus. Do you understand that? That's really not too theological to understand. Because it would happen today. If you hang out with the wrong people, people then 
look at you in the same skewed up way. The, the people you, especially if there's been a, a bond that, that's publicly understood, then what they did is, is uh, you, you've been around the wrong people. Even today, in, in court case, if you, you've been a close friend to the, the prisoner, well, we're going to investigate you. Now, take that to the very being and heart of God in what he's doing. Jesus sat with these men. And somewhere else in the Bible it says uh, the, that the, their, their shame fell upon me. Jesus is shamed with our sin. Can you, can you understand? That's what it's saying. He loves you not by ignoring your sin, but by making your sin his. That's unconditional love. And, and, and you are shamed? Well, he's shamed with you. You're condemned, guilty, yes, but he takes, that's why he loves. Of course, it's the end of religion. Religion never talks about that. We're back to reward and punishment. But the entrance of Jesus is the new. If you, you look at, in the Old Testament, he said, I'll do a new thing. And using a word which, which means you've, you don't have a clue. The, the Old Testament says we can't even explain it or talk about it. It's so new. When Jesus came, we speak of the new covenant, the new creation, the new mankind. New, new, new. And it's that word which means beyond. Take everything you understand as new and make that your starting point. We're now going where you've never been before. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, never entered into anybody's imagination. It's so new. It isn't like the world. It's not even like the world on steroids. It just, pfft, it isn't. It's new. And that's why irreligion was so angry, because they feel... <laughs> Control is slipping out of their fingers. They're, they're no longer the great, wonderful religious people because there's something new. And that something new is so wonderful, marvelous, beautiful, gentle, kind, unlike the harsh, cruel religion. The entrance of Jesus. Never known what he was in, never known before, never known, never, never imagined, never grasped. Unconditional love of God. It's the heart of the gospel. See, unconditional love. Well, God is that unconditional love. Jesus is God, incarnate. There again, we don't talk much about that these days. Jesus isn't prophet. Jesus isn't to be put alongside all the religions of the world. It's totally unlike. When I, I've been in various parts of the world, and, and those who haven't really heard the gospel, which unfortunately are many, um, but they're in the church, yeah. and um, if, they, if you go into their home, they have their God shelf. And, and there will be a number of gods, if you want to call it, little idols on the shelf. And at the end is, is an idol of Jesus. Because they say, well, you know, all these other gods are still active in my life, but Jesus is really kind of number one. And I say, do you want me to show you what the gospel really is? Oh, yes, they do. And I take my hand, I sweep everything on the floor. No, Jesus, Jesus is not one of one. He's the only one. Can, can you, you imagine it? God has become human. He has taken human to himself and never stopped being fully God. But he is now human, so he's fully us. So he can relate to me totally. He's human. 
God isn't remote. He's absolutely one of us. He experiences human pain. He, he's got human eyes to cry with. God became human. Why? Well, that's unconditional love that says, I'm not going to stand on the edge and call to you. I'm coming in. That, that, the incarnation is God saying, I'm coming in. Absolutely where you are, into your darkness, to sit with you and be united to you and actually take your sin. So I am condemned with your sin. That, that's, that's Jesus. Uh, and that's, that's what's happening here. And that's why I said it's the most powerful, the most relentless. This will never quit. Because you see, there's nothing I can do to stop God loving me. He's relentless. His purest energy, always drawing us to himself. And you say, I don't want it. I choose hell on earth. Okay. I'll come and sit with you until you're ready to go on. Uh huh. Don't know what to do with that, you see. I thought if I told God I'm choosing hell on earth, he would leave me be. But instead, he joined me there. That's the gospel. He whispers unfailing love while we sit together in the darkness. And I'm here, him talking to Father, and he says, Father, forgive her. She doesn't know what she's doing. But I'll stay with her until her mind has been enlightened. And in all that time, he keeps no record of wrong. Unconditional love is forgiveness. And again, it's not what the world calls forgiveness. I forgive you. When God says, I forgive you, it, it means he goes down into the depths of our being. He unties knots that we could never untie, which means he reverses everything. He collapses my actions. And I stand before God as if I never sinned. That's forgiveness. He wipes it out. It's gone. Not like the world talks about it. And I think it's obvious by now, unconditional love is without reference to behavior. You see, the only way, hear me very carefully, the only way our behavior can be changed is by someone who loves us unconditionally, which means they love me while I'm doing the hated behavior and says, I will never let you go. You didn't earn that, you see. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. And all the other stuff that reward and punishment talk. He blasted into our behaviors and said, I love you. And when you are loved unconditionally, that leads to change, radical change. Have you noticed when you're confronted by the law, by religion, it only makes it worse? Really? I, for me, it does. You tell me you shall not do that, and I'll punish you if you do. I do it and find a way around the punishment. That's the truth. But when I say I love you just as you are, and I'm never going to leave you. A change has already begun inside me. Think about that. <laughs> and unconditional love is always in a mood for a party. <laughs> there, is, there is a laughter in the heart of God that will not be put down. 
be wherever you go in these parables, that's where you end up. And it was this rejoicing, this feast, I say again, that Jesus said was necessary. Necessary. And remember that means a divine necessity. God says we've got to have a party. And what's the party about? The party is about loving people who don't deserve it and that love such an energy is to change their lives. That's what it was about. Unconditional love is not a cold decision. Unconditional love is being pulled into a party to celebrate love and grace. It's accompanied by loud shouts and laughter. It had to be because it attracted the Pharisees and everybody else. And in the story that follows, the, the elder brother could hear the racket as he's out in the fields. And he says, what's going on? See, and, and, and that's what enrages the Pharisees. They claim to be custodians of the knowledge of God. But now comes something they don't know a thing about. Utterly unknown. And it all centered upon Jesus that they're already beginning to hate. And that's why they responded with rage, disgust. And final rejection. It's a sad statement, but there are many, many churches here in the West that would feel more comfortable standing with the Pharisees than they would with Jesus. Our churches, they allow Jesus a portion, you know. They, they give Jesus... You know, there, there's this group of people who go down and feed the poor on Skid Row and visit prisons. But they, the church just, that, that's okay. We're, we're fulfilling our, our ministry. You know, it's, but um, you try bringing those people into church. Yeah. The deacons will escort them out, you see. Uh, we, we, we feel the comfortables are com the Pharisees are a comfortable bunch. Uh, they're nice, they're decent, acceptable, morally right, sort of. But we feel okay, but you read God loves everybody, but loves him in the way I've been trying to say in the last minutes. And this is Jesus, God from God, as we've said, revealing God. And he's the only one that can change our behavior just by loving us. And he's the one that brings an unspeakable joy and rejoicing that originates in the heart of God. And notice he had to do it. That was part of the necessary. Why, why did Jesus do this in public? You know, the suggestion is there was a, a table set right downtown. And, because everybody could see, the Pharisees could see it. This is, you see, why, why didn't he do it in private? Because he knew it would upset the whole nation. <laughs> Um, let's, let's do it in a back room you know come sneaking through the door knock three times and ask for Susie you know it's th this isn't a feast that the paparazzi caught him uh, and now it's all over the place no he started this he put it out in public and when they questioned him he said it was necessary why why is it so necessary that Jesus did this in public so everybody would be upset? <laughs> Why? So that everybody was shocked. Everybody stood with mouth open at what they saw because of what I'm saying. This is the new and it's bursting in on the old. This is not something done in a corner. 
The old has got to be shocked. The old has got to be enraged. And to realize this is the new. It was an event that said in plain language that Jesus was bringing a new kind of love that was different to the religious. The way of religion, the way of reward and punishment, the way of Jesus originating in unconditional love that cut through behavior and loved the person and in so doing changed the person. This is the challenge today, everybody. What is the, nat- what is the nature of salvation? It, it's so difficult, you know, in Texas especially, on those, you know, on Zoom, um, maybe what I'm saying is, you know, it's got the brush of Texas on it. Because I remember when I, I lived in New York City for a number of years. And, of course, in New York City, you're, you're surrounded by sin. There's a lot of tax collectors and sinners there. But they knew it and didn't try to hide it. And we knew it. I mean, it was, and I was invited. Remember, I come from England. Okay, so I landed, well, beside the point, but I was coming from New York City. I'd never been to Texas. I'd heard all the stories of Texas, but I'd never been here. And I remember landing in Dallas and going to get a cup of coffee. And it was a bar and a coffee shop combined. And this character was standing on the bar side. I was on the coffee side. And I heard him say, I'll have some Baptist tea. Baptist tea. Beer with a straw in it. (laughs) So when he went back to his seat, they thought it was iced tea. Baptist tea. I thought, this is Texas. In in New York, you wouldn't bother. You just get beer and you let the chips fall where they will. But not in Texas. We're going to pretend... We don't drink here, you see. And I found that throughout my stay. I realized, and God bless you, I I got to Texas as fast as I could. I love living here. But you are dealing with a hypocrisy here that's very much like the Pharisee. You don't call it the Bible Belt for nothing. We're, 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 we're right. We're not as others. Huh. I say again, what is salvation? Is it all this stupid putting on behavior show because I've got to be better then? And, and well, listen, listen to, the, to what is being said in terms of preaching the gospel. It's all... Have you ever heard anything about what's happening in my life tonight? It's always when you die, when you die. Accept Jesus, when you die, you go to heaven. And incidentally, that's not in the New Testament. (laughs) I don't know what heaven is. Uh, That was a word invented by the old Jews because they were afraid of saying the word God. Heaven? You you talk about a little, little place with Roses at the door and mansions over the hilltop. That is rubbish. Go to heaven when you die. And then we talk about the, well, unashamedly talk about reward and punishment. Uh Uh-oh. Well, if that's one way of looking at salvation. But there's the other way that came with Jesus, the wonder of unconditional love that radically changes a person's life, sweeping them into fellowship with the Father through Jesus the Son in the Holy Spirit. 
which changes my understanding of holiness. Holiness is not that rigid, miserable face that says, you're wrong. Holiness is, will you have this dance with me? Let us rejoice and be glad. That's holiness. What is righteousness? It's not rigidly keeping all the commands. Righteousness, according to the Bible, is we sit down face to face, loving each other with the love of God. Forgiveness and judgment. Jesus took the judgment. There's no more judgment for us. Judgment for us means I've made everything right. Huh. That was my introduction. And we've hardly started yet. But I've got to say this. He, he, he tells the parable. You know, the parable is not just a story. A parable was meant to upset you. That was the meaning of a parable. It's going to sneak in. And when you think you know what the end is going to be, he turns it around and he sure did it here. He talks about a younger son coming home. But he's coming home, and I don't know if you've ever realized this. He was coming home with the distorted, twisted image of his father. He was scared of his father. And you've got to understand that. And I know that by his little prayer that he composed, you know. He's coming home. He believed it. He really believed his father was going to be angry with him. He really believed he was going to be punished in some way or another. He looked upon his father as someone impossible to please. That was a lie. Of all lies in this story, it was, it was a lie. In fact, he saw his father as the, the judge in a world of reward and punishment. And within him, he submitted to that image of his father. And so before that false image of his father, he turns on himself. Because if his father is like that, I'm no good. I've screwed it up. I've wasted my life. It's self-loathing, condemning. And, and I, I deserve to be punished. That became his necessity. Yeah. A, the God you worship then brings a certain necessity to your life. Mm -hmm. And if God is the judge who can't stand the sight of me, then it is necessary for me to self-condemn, say I'm not worthy, I'm self-loathing and I'm going to be punished. That's a necessity. It's a must. Because if that isn't so, then what I know about God isn't so. Do you follow that? So because of that, he writes a speech. Uh, or I could say, and I'm not being snarky here, he produced a sinner's prayer. It's a prayer almost word for word used today. It was, a, it was a, a prayer that was in response to the what he thought his father was going to be and do. And so, put it this, it was his best shot at calming his father down so that when he met his father, he would be in control of the situation. I've got ahead of my father. Before my father has a chance, I'm going to tell him, you're right, Dad, you're right. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called my son. I'm ahead of the game. I'm still in control. As many people today feel they're in control of God, as long as they can say the right words, self-loathing. I've got God... He would grovel. I'm an unforgivable sinner. I agree with you, Dad. I'm an unforgivable sinner. Yes, I deserve punishment. 
Throw me out. I deserve it. And one thing I ask, just mercy, that you'll make me as one of your hired servants, which is someone who didn't live on the ranch and was called when there was a need for extra work. It was a step above being a slave. But it was no relationship. No relationship. Just on the payroll maybe once or twice a year. So he carried that sinner's prayer in his head. He's repeating it. He's got to get it right. On the journey back home, that's all he can think of. I've got to be in control here. It's a dicey situation. I'll get ahead of the father. I'll stop the flood of his rage. Can you really get inside that head? And suddenly it seemed out of nowhere his father is there, right in his face. But instead he is weeping and laughing all at the same time. Laughing. Good grief, what's going on? Laughing. And then he sweeps him into a bear hug, nearly crashes his ribs. And he kisses his face again and again and again and again. And this kid has just come from sleeping with the pigs. He smells like a pig. Hasn't bathed in months and the father doesn't care. He just puts his face into the pig muck and kisses him. I think most people today are as shocked by that as this kid was. We don't associate that kind of behavior with God. To most people, God is the ultimate serious, miserable, nitpicking. Picking me up in a bear hug? I didn't make that up. That's the exact word used in Luke 15. Your Bible says he fell on his neck. But that word in the Greek is bear hug. And in the margin of your Bible, it said he kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him again. Yes. Oh, yeah. God throwing a party? He's the party pooper. God doesn't <laughs> throw parties. <laughs> really? You see, why do we think that? Because our image of God is the judge. And therefore, it is necessary for me to cower. It's necessary to call myself unworthy and no good and be afraid. That's necessary to fit in with the God I think he is. The best this kid expected was called silence. MB, I'll see you in my office. Instead, I mean, get it. Don't just read this like they've read it for 2,000 years. Read it. What is going on? He's confused. He didn't expect to be greeted with laughter and kisses and hugs. He is now out of control. I don't know where. <laughs> if this is my dad, I, I don't know what to do. I'm out of control. Uh, all the way here, he's been in control. I'm going to get him out. But his dad got ahead of him, but not in the way he thought. And he's out of control. The father has taken totally unexpected action. How is he going to get control? He pulls away from his father and says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father says, Servants, bring the best robe and put it on him. He dismisses his sinner's prayer. Don't, 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 don't mess. Don't upset. 
Don't, don't spoil a wonderful day with a sinner's prayer. Read it. I'm not making this up. <laughs> he, what, what was he saying in that prayer? Please, please. It's a, life is a matter of reward and punishment. I can't live with what you're doing. I can't live with your laughter and your joy. We've got to have reward and punishment here. And I, I need to be punished. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Stop talking to me like this. I need to be punished. Send me, send me out. Make me a hired servant. That's necessary for me in order to conform with what I think you are. And the father says, but I'm not. I'm not. And so he said, you're my son. Get it. You're my son. You always have been my son. You couldn't be other than my son. And so you are my son, and you will always be my son. And therefore, these who are my servants will now become your servants. You're my son, but you're not my son in disgrace. My servants are now going to serve you, and they will bring you a robe. They're going to put shoes on your feet. And the father walks over to him and puts on him a signet ring. Do you know what that is? It's a, this is a signet ring, actually. Um, it, you press it in the wax and it leaves an impression. The signet ring that he put on him was the ring of the family. It meant you are in this family. This is your American Express card. You go into a store, press, it's the family, you know. Stunned, speechless. I, I, he's totally out of control. He doesn't know how, how to handle this father. He doesn't know. The father says, you are my son, which means you stand in relationship to me. I believe it was in somewhere in there where the father didn't listen to his sinner's prayer, but instead went on to say, you're my son. Somewhere in there, it happened. It happened still, he's still stunned, but he, he's hearing. And his image of his father has crumbled and collapsed and now he's trying to understand who his father really is. And Jesus uses the word all the way through this chapter. Remember, if you've been reading it, where it says there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. He repeats it. Now, this is very, very, very important. I'm not just, you know, on my thing. The word repentance should be forever washed out of the Bible. It is the most, and I'm going to use the word devilish, translation of a beautiful word. It was translated as repentance back in, I don't know when, I'll, I'll say 14th, 15th century. Do you know what repentance means in English? In English, re means in Latin, to do it again and again and again. Re, repeat, re, re. And pent means penance. It's a Roman Catholic word from the days when the Roman Catholic was a thousand times worse than it is today. Re, penance. It means if God is going to accept me, I've got to do repeated penance. I've got to do something and do something and do something just to get his attention, just to have him bless me. And they translated a beautiful word by that filthy word of reward and punishment. 
The word in the Greek is metanoia, and that means, well, let me start telling you what it means. It means the awakening of your mind, that your mind now, as the fog is being cleared away, I can perceive, I can see clearly now, and I realign my mind, radically realign my mind to God's logic, to God's reasoning, to God's thinking, to God's seeing. And I rediscover my original and true value. I rediscover my identity, which begins a radical change in my behavior, which always follows my thoughts. Which means that faith is not a decision. Faith is, wow, a discovery of this world I've come into that metanoia has brought me to. That's what happened here. The boy has metanoia. He is seeing everything as he's never seen it before. Seen his father as he's never seen his father before. Which now opens up possibilities and it's still vague. He hardly knows this is This is a father's wonderland. I I don't know where I am. I, I don't know what's happening. I can't believe it, but I'm beginning to get it. I'm seeing my father is not what I thought he was. That produces a new necessity. Everything changes. Everything changes. His relationship. You are my son. That doesn't say you are the winner. It doesn't say you have become the most decent person on the block. You're you're not the servant of the weak. All of that is reward and punishment. He says, you're my son. The one thing the boy said he wasn't, the father said, you are my son. That is relationship. Different, different. Do you understand? Reward and punishment, anybody can do that. McDonald's could make you the best, you know, you know. But son, you, you can't earn that. That that's the connection of two persons at every level. Relationship could be covenant. You're bound together as a relationship. That exchange of lives, participation together. It's dependence upon each other. You're joined. Um, kinfolk, that's relationship. Um, It exists between two people, always. So it brings about the word together, union, the delight, the one in the other. There's no separation there. There's no division. You enjoy each other. Spend private time. So that marriage in the Bible is translated many times as no. Come to know someone means you're married. Relationship. And I say again, you can't earn it. It is. To the kid, you are my son. You were my son. You never ever stop being my son. And you'll always be my son. It's a relationship. And the younger brother stands stunned. There's no other word for it. Speechless. Before the laughter, the delight of his father and the announcement, we are in relationship and you can't break it. The radical change in his life was when he believed in his father's laughter. He believed in his father's joy. Do you get that? He says, I'm no good, and the father laughed. And the son believed in his laughter and laughed with him. That's, um, and it says, 
together they went into the feast. That's the most wonderful together. That is Father and Son, and the Son believing what the Father said of him, accepting his true identity, the new necessity, they go in. Listen carefully, the Son had taken a stand against his own beliefs. Now that's metanoia. I've seen something that is more real than what I've believed. So I take a stand against what I believe. And I stand then with my Father. And I believe what my Father believes about me against what I've believed about myself. He joined with the Father's faith. Join with the Father's knowledge. And look, together. Have you noticed when a person thinks they're a beggar, they shuffle their feet and they bend their body? They don't have to be wearing bad clothes. You just, you know, it shows. They're, they're shuffling and no good, no good. It, it fits their body when they say, give me a dime, you know. That's the boy that came home. But now together. Each one reflecting the other. Together. Relationship. They go in. And that's the boy that had abandoned all possibility of relationship. He came from a different world. I'll settle for a hired servant. Now dressed in his father's clothes, together with his father, he goes in. And it's unconditional love because there's no reason for him to. And the father, the Jesus at the end said, it is necessary that we go in because that feast reflects who I am. That feast has the exegesis of what it means to be loved unconditionally. In that feast is what grace looks like. That's love. That's the newness that I'm bringing. It's right there. So therefore it's necessary. It was necessary for you to think you were no good if you believed I was a judge. That's collapsed. You've seen who I am, therefore it's necessary that we go into the feast. And the word in the, the Greek is to be overwhelmed with joy and gladness, a flooding of your, yourself with that. Um, that's the good news. Everything else you might hear, regardless of the name on the door, is bad news. That's who God really is in the face of Jesus Christ. And anything else puts tar on his beautiful face. Amen. And amen. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have revealed yourself in Jesus. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who opens our eyes to see who you truly are. And let my words of this morning take fire and burn inside everyone that heard them. That we shall become a company who live in the necessity of feasting, <laughs> laughing in your presence at the wonder of your love. Let it be so. Lord Jesus Christ, amen, amen. and amen.